Thanks for staying with us here on News Channel 8. The NFL Players Union and team owners concluded meetings here in the Washington area yesterday. Both sides keeping quiet about their recent negotiations, but a 24-hour extension may suggest that there's at least the potential for a long-term deal that would avoid a lockout. We'll talk to a former Redskins salary cap analyst in just a moment, but first, the latest from ABC's T.J. Winnick. There's a glimmer of hope in the fight over a new NFL labor contract. Both sides agreed on a 24-hour extension. For all of our fans uh, who dig our game, uh, we appreciate your patience as we work through this. Um, we're going to keep working. We want to play football. Thursday, the league and the players union met for a 10th day with a federal mediator. President Obama said he does not want to get involved. The time when uh, people are having to cut back, compromise, you know, paying for their kids' college education is, is that the two parties should be able to work it out without the President of the United States intervening. A work stoppage would mean no spring practice, no free agency deals, and potentially no 2011 season. I think everybody's concern is, where's the timetable from here, and where does it go? There are two main issues. First, money. How to divide up the NFL's annual revenue of about $9 billion. The second issue is the schedule. The league wants to add two more regular season games for a total of 18. The players say that increases their risk of injury and they deserve additional compensation. We just need to come up to an agreement and get back on the field. The last NFL work stoppage was in 1987 when the players struck. One game was canceled and three games were played with replacement players before a deal got done. T.J. Winnick, ABC News, New York. Joining us now here in the studio, ESPN 980 NFL insider and former Redskins salary cap analyst, J.I. Halsell. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for very having much. Me. So what do you read into the 24-hour uh, extension that was uh, agreed upon late yesterday? It's definitely encouraging because yesterday we pretty much had either an extension or we we're going to have decertification of the union. And the extension route was the more optimistic route. And so it seems like they're making progress here. They're going to negotiate a further extension, whether that's a one-week extension or a two-week extension so that they can really hammer, hammer out the complexities of a new deal. Sort of like Congress with uh, coming up on that March 4th deadline to keep the federal government funded. Uh, Very good parallel. A lot, of, a lot of times it's, and this is true, of course, of all negotiations, it's when the pressure builds and the deadline draws close, a lot of times that's when the progress occurs. And you may not get the entire way, but if there is progress that both sides can point to, it might open the door to another day, another week, what have you. Timing always plays a big role in any negotiation once you particularly have a hard deadline that you have to get a, de a deal done by. But when you look at this negotiation, leverage has always also been a big, situ uh, big issue. Uh, when you look at the owners losing the television lockout money uh, that Judge Doty basically ruled as being illegal, and that was a huge shift in leverage towards the union. Now, we do have one outstanding issue with the union as it relates to the owner's claim that if the union were to decertify, that it would be a sham decertification that they would mm -hmm. only decertify for the purpose of gaining leverage in, a, in the course of a negotiation. So that's still outstanding, but if this were a football game, it would seem like the momentum right now is shifted in the favor of the union. Since that piece of it, the decertification, which is not being done because those who are represented are no longer satisfied with their representation, it's a, it is kind of a ploy and a scheme, if you will, as part of uh, their broader strategy one could see how the union, uh, excuse me, how the owners in the league might raise a red flag and say, hey, uh, this isn't true decertification, this is uh, a part of a process. Exactly, and, and there's, there's a certain precedent here too, because the union decertified back in 1987 so that they could do the, go the antitrust suit route, and that was actually what enacted or what resulted from that was the 1993 collective bargaining agreement. So because the union has done this once before, the owners position is that, well, look, they've done it once before. We've seen, it, this, we've seen this before. And, you know, they weren't decertifying because the players did not want a union anymore. They decertified for strategic purposes. It's been talked about some, but take us through it for just so uh, we're all on the same page about the $4 billion uh, four billion dollars in TV money oh, and right. the legal ruling uh, there that has come in just the recent days. Basically what happened was the owners negotiated a television deal that would allow for them to receive four billion dollars in television money even if there was no product on the field, even if there was a lockout. And now, now don't get me wrong, in the next television contract negotiation they would basically get, give some of that money back to the networks as a concession for basically fronting them the money during the lockout. But nonetheless, it was a four billion dollar war chest that they would have at their disposal to kind of help pay the bills in the event of a lockout. Meanwhile, the players 
they don't they didn't have that same type of savings to help get them through an extended or protracted lockout. And so when you take that four billion dollars away from the owners, it's a significant loss of leverage because at the end of the day, they also have bills to pay as well. And this was a four billion dollars that was sort of programmed in years ago with an eye toward what owners knew would be this moment now where uh, the existing agreement was coming to an end and they thought, oh, we can bank some money, we can get paid for putting nothing on TV, for having no product. In, in theory, it was, a, it was a great strategic move on their part, you know, and I'm sure they had planned uh, in the event that Judge Doty, who basically oversees the collective bargaining agreement, that he would overrule that money. So I'm sure they had planned accordingly, but nonetheless, you know, you would hope it, from the owner's perspective to still have access to that, but it's not going to be the case. We're going to keep J.I. Halsell with us the rest of the way. We've got phone lines open now for 10 a.m. viewers to join us. If you have a question or comment uh, about uh, the ongoing uh, NFL uh, negotiations between owners and players, we invite your questions and comments. The number here, 703-387-1020. We'll go to the phones, oh, oh, as always, as your questions and comments come in. We're also going to talk about some of the team's acquisitions, uh, particularly a, a notable one just in the last 24 hours or so, and we'll uh, peek ahead to the uh, upcoming NFL draft and, and what the Redskins might do with the, the picks they have there. Phone lines open, 703-387-1020. We welcome your questions and comments. We'll go to the phones as your calls come in. My view, and I think the view of just about everyone, from the uh, fan-in-chief uh, there at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to, to, to just about all of us who like the game, it's profitable, it's doing well. They are raking it in by the billions. How come they can't get in a room and divide this ginormous pie in a way that benefits all without any kind of lockout or, or uh, anyone hitting the pause button in terms of next season happening as it should? You know what's interesting is that the owners were the ones who actually picked this fight, if you will. They were the ones who opted out of the collective bargaining agreement early, basically saying that the margins were not increasing at a level such that they could continue to grow the game. Basically, and they said that player costs were one of the major reasons why their margins were being cut short. And so, at the end of the day, look, the players make a lot of money, the owners make a lot of money, and from the casual fans' perspective, they're like, you know, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And to your point, you know, everyone, I think, at the end of the day, wants to just see football. And I don't, I'm not exactly sure that the casual fan really gets into the minutia of the, the negotiation right now. But you would think that their calmer heads would prevail and that a deal could get done. Do owners feel like the last deal uh, didn't really uh, benefit them, that, that, that it, the players won, if you will, in the last negotiation and for either legitimate financial reasons or pride, ego, or a combination, they're trying to right the wrong of last time? Oh, absolutely. The 2006 CBA was very player friendly. Um, the late Gene Upshaw did a great job of brokering that deal. Um, the economic model that came out of that 06 deal, clearly the owners felt like did not, you know, meet their needs from what they need to do in order to grow the game, yet they won't open up their books to prove their point in that regard. But from a D. Smith perspective, because that 06 deal was so good, there, there's not much upside for him in in this regard in terms of getting an even better deal here in 2011. Maintain so, the status so quo he's playing be. goalie in, in a lot of respects with this new deal. You used to be able to get a stadium for a couple hundred million dollars. Now it seems they're a billion and more because they've they've just thought of all, this, all the bells and whistles. All the bells and whistles. And and I, I will grant you, as someone who remembers Yankee Stadium, Shea Stadium, Giant Stadium and many others, uh, 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 RFK and, of mm -hmm. course, uh, Redskins Field. Uh, you know, you, 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 if, you're, if you're a lover of the game, you get into these places and, you, and, you, and you're, you're, sometimes your jaw drops and you're comparing one to the other to see what they have and, and, and et cetera. Uh, at some point, either it doesn't need to have every bell or whistle that's ever been conceived or pay for it yourself. Exactly. But, you know, there's got to be a limit to how over the top these things can be. And particularly when you're asking for the public, the taxpayers, to, f to fit the bill in a lot of instances. Now, the league does have a what's called the G3 fund, which is set aside to help fund new stadiums, but they don't find it, it's not going to finance 100% the construction costs. And so what a lot of owners or the NFL will do is 
leverage the Los Angeles market as an example against the host city to, you know, basically say, well, if you don't give us a new stadium, we, we still have L.A. as a possibility to move your team. So it'd be nice if you guys as taxpayers could help us uh, build this new stadium. Just help us just, a little. You know, just like the CBA negotiations, all about leverage. Yeah. We, know, we know you're laying off teachers and uh, doing all these things, but help us with the stadium. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Talking with uh, NFL insider from ESPN 980, J.I. Halsa. We'll take a break. We're back with more news talk. Right back. Welcome back to News Talk here on News Channel 8. I'm Bruce DePoit alongside J.I. Halsell. He's a NFL, San NFL salary cap expert, former uh, salary cap analyst for the Washington Redskins, now an NFL insider for ESPN 980 Radio. Phone lines open as we continue to talk with him and with you on this Friday. If you have a question or comment about the NFL labor talks or anything else, join us by calling 703-387-1020. Grab an open line now so we can get to your call as quickly as possible. Pretty good acquisition for the Washington Redskins just in the last 24 hours as they move to shore up uh, their defensive secondary. Absolutely. O.J. Atagwe, playmaking safety from, Saint Lu from the St. Louis Rams. Uh, when I say playmaking, interceptions, forced fumbles. Uh, th is 30 years old, though, so that might be a little bit of a concern for Redskins fans in terms of how long will he really be able to play at that level. Uh, $5 million per year, five-year deal for $26 million, so five year, five million dollars per year. Pretty good uh, value for a player with his productivity. When you look at the elite safety market, is $7 million per year plus. Um, now, there is the issue with LaRon Landry now, because if you bring in O.J. Otago at $5 million per year, LaRon Landry's going into the final year of his rookie contract. He's most likely going to be looking at a long-term extension. He's going to want close to probably $7 million per year, if not more. That's a lot of money tied up into your safety position when that is typically a position where you could probably save money on any other team. So uh, you're looking at making a significant investment uh, in that position if LaRon Landry gets a contract extension. Reaction to uh, the Atagwe, I'm struggling uh, yeah. with the pronunciation of his name. Uh, I'll call him OJ. OJ. <laughs> uh, reaction to, to this news on your station and others was pretty good yesterday. Yeah. He's somebody that fans are who fans know and, and, and like. And, hearing, and just hearing the reaction from the fan base, they're, they're in favor of the move. Uh, they, they've seen the, the plays that he's made. As a matter of fact, back in the 2008 season, I believe, or 2007 season, he actually had a, scored a defensive touchdown against the Redskins at FedEx Field. So they've seen firsthand his playmaking ability. So it, it's a good uh, signing. You know, Kareem Moore had injury issues last season, still has a lot of promise as a young player. But here's a proven veteran who's made plays. You've seen him do it, is familiar with defensive coordinator Jim Haslett and his defense has played for uh, Coach Haslett in St. Louis. Uh, so it seems like a pretty solid uh, signing. What is the uh, Redskins' uh, overall salary cap situation right now? They're in a great situation going forward. They really leveraged the uncapped year of 2010 to really clean up their books, if you will, uh, by restructuring Albert Hainsworth's contract, who we'll talk about later on, and D'Angelo Hall's contract. They really left a lot of that money that would have been in future years and left it all here in the uncapped 2010 year. So that that way, going forward, Unlike historically where the Redskins have been pressed up against the salary cap, they've actually got some flexibility, and so they position themselves really, really well. Now, I, perhaps I misread things, but I thought that as we came to the conclusion of last season, I thought that if there was any sure thing about this team, it was that Albert Hainsworth was not coming back. Right. And yet now there are questions about whether that's in fact the case. I, I think when you look at, they've released Clinton Portis this week, they've released Derek Dockery, they've released Andre Carter, which allowed these guys to be able to hit the market, at least for the last three to four days of the league year and potentially sign elsewhere. You would have thought that perhaps Albert Hainsworth would be part of those terminations, but why would you, given kind of everything he's put you through as an organization, why would you let him go right now to potentially sign with a new team, get a new contract before a potential lockout and receive some money? I'm not saying that they're necessarily sticking sticking it to him intentionally, but when you look at the four-game suspension at the end of the season, that essentially ended his season, precluded him from signing somewhere else to maybe go to a team that was going to the playoffs, and so, you know, maybe they release him once the CBA gets done and later in the league year. He came here certainly with a great reputation for on-the-field play, and I thought an okay reputation generally. Obviously, the, the it's been controversy on top of controversy during his Redskins tenure. As, a, as someone you might trade and get something for, is 
Is he still considered marketable, all things considered? Yeah, I don't think there's much of a trade market for Albert at this point, particularly with the two off-the-field inc incidents over the past month or so. Oh, of course. And so it has further diminished his trade value. And so if you're one of the other 31 clubs, you've got to really anticipate that he'll be released. So why give up a draft pick for him? And then do you really want to give up a draft pick for a guy with questionable off-the-field character? Jay, I stand, uh, stand by for just a moment. We're going to take a, a really a final break here and come back with a bit more of our conversation. Don't go away. Continuing our conversation now with ESPN 980 analyst J.I. Hallsell. Let's talk about the upcoming NFL draft. Uh, what is it the Redskins are most likely to do? They've clearly got a number of needs. Some are suggesting that that first pick, is, it's number 10 overall. Pick number 10. Go, there, there are enough needs on this team. Go for the best player at almost any, almost independent of position at number 10. Yeah, when you have so many needs and, you know, I don't know if you necessarily want to take a quarterback there at number 10 where everybody says take the quarterback, whether it's Cam Newton, Blaine Gabbert. When you look at young quarterbacks in this league who have done well, Matt Ryan, Joe Flacco, those guys walked into situations where there are pieces around them, whether in Atlanta, you know, there's Roddy White at wide receiver, there's Michael Turner at running back, there's Tony Gonzalez at tight end. They drafted a left tackle to protect him. We don't have that situation here in Washington. So to your point, at pick number 10, whether it's Vaughn Miller to play 3-4 outside linebacker opposite of Brian Arakpo, um, maybe even a Julio Jones at wide receiver to get a playmaking wide receiver, particularly with Santana Moss being unsigned at this juncture and at a later stage of his career. Uh, yeah, the best player at 10 and not necessarily a quarterback is the way the Redskins will probably go. Do you have a sense as to whether they'll likely keep the picks they have now as opposed to trading to get additional picks or move up, move down, that kind of That's thing? That's a great question because last year they had pick number four overall and it's hard to trade out of those top five picks just because the, of the money, which is probably going to get recalibrated as part of this new CBA deal in terms of the guarantees going to those top ten picks or so. But here you are this year at pick number ten and it's a lot easier to trade down and when you're talking about a team that doesn't have a third or fourth round pick, perhaps it's in their best interest to trade down in the first round so that you can get more picks and particularly when you have so many needs that you need to fill on the roster. And if there's any suspicion that the guy you're going for might be there in five picks or whatever. Absolutely. And it's a double win because you slide down, you still get the guy potentially that you want, and from a financial perspective, it's less guaranteed money. You were at the Combine in uh, Indianapolis. That's got to be an amazing uh, place to, you know, that's got to be an amazing experience yeah. in terms of seeing... Uh, who's out there and just the general overall buzz. Yeah, the Combine's an awesome event every year and it's more than just what you see on television, what goes on on the field, because it's also the meetings um, in, in at the restaurants, at the hotels there between the agents and the teams talking about the, ne the next group of free agents, veteran players, to try to work out at least high level deals. And also just, to, you know, that's where agents and uh, cap guys, contract negotiators, really build those relationships because any, any negotiation, whether we're talking about the union and the owners or a team and an agent is all about relationships. We only have about 30 seconds left. Do you have any general sense that pressure from the public might be helping push both camps into a, a, a deal that keeps us away from lockout and keeps the 11th season intact? I don't know if it's pressure, but they're cognizant of the PR aspect of this. I think, again, the Judge Doty ruling on the television money is, is a huge game changer in terms of leverage. And um, it seems, at, these, at least at this point, that they're moving in the right direction and look for a further extension to give them a little more time to hammer out the details. Let's hope they do it. J.I., thanks very much. Thank appreciate you. you being here. We really, Thank you. Uh, appreciate talking with you today. J.I. Halsell of ESPN 980, former Redskins salary cap expert, back with a program note.